you're getting good marks for your OCR GCSE English language practice questions, but not full marks. Perhaps you feel you're pretty good at exploring the language in the extracts, but are a bit more hazy about how to tackle structure. This video will include some very specific tips on how to answer this question, and there'll be a model answer for the November 2017 past paper. Let's increase your chances of getting full marks for paper two, question two. Stay tuned and watch Schofield on Shakespeare. You have memorized the mark scheme, haven't you? Here's how the top three bands look. What strikes me about this is the use of that irritating word both within the top band. You won't get full marks just for talking eloquently and intelligently about language, about that simile or that metaphor, say. You also need to be able to show consistent insight into the effects of the writer's structure. And if you don't get the balance right, well, you could end up in level four or lower. Zooming in on the top band, note that your appreciation of language and structure needs to be sophisticated. So I'm afraid you can't just state the bleeding obvious. And you also need to be precise with your use of subject terminology. I'm often surprised how a few of my pupils remain slightly hazy with the difference between nouns and verbs or metaphors and personification, for example. To get full marks, you need to be writing this verb suggests that rather than this suggests that. My sense is very much that pupils can be better writing about language as opposed to structure. This is confirmed within a groan from a past OCR examiner report. Well, when writing about structure, you should be using some of the terms and phrases on screen now. Press pause if you would like to write these down. This video will resume in five seconds time. So how might some of these terms be used within a response, exploring the structure of a passage? Well, why don't we dive straight into one of my favourite books, Mary Elizabeth Braddon's tremendously exciting Lady Audley's Secret, to do some modelling. Just to explain the background, he is Robert Audley, Sir Michael Audley's nephew. He has found out that his uncle Sir Michael has married bigamously. In this extract, Robert forces Sir Michael's bigamous wife, Lady Audley, to tell her husband the truth about her past. He met Sir Michael in the hall. He made no attempt to prepare the way for the terrible revelation which the baronet was to hear. He only drew him into the firelit library, and there for the first time addressed him quietly thus. Lady Audley has a confession to make to you, sir a confession which I know will be a most cruel surprise, a most bitter grief. But it is necessary for your present honour and for your future peace that you should hear it. She has deceived you, I regret to say, most basely. But it is only right that you should hear from her own lips any excuses which she may have to offer for her wickedness. May God soften this blow for you, sobbed the young man, suddenly breaking down. I cannot. Sir Michael lifted his hand as if he would command his nephew to be silent, but that imperious hand dropped feeble and impotent at his side. He stood in the centre of the firelit room, rigid and immovable. Lucy, he cried in a voice whose anguish struck like a blow upon the jarred nerves of those who heard it, as the cry of a wounded animal pains the listener. Lucy, Tell me that this man is a madman. Tell me so, my love, or I shall kill him. There was a sudden fury in his voice as he turned upon Robert, 
as if he could indeed have felled his wife's accuser to the earth with the strength of his uplifted arm. But my lady fell upon her knees at his feet, interposing herself between the baronet and his nephew, who stood leaning on the back of an easy chair with his face hidden by his hands. He has told you the truth, said my lady. Now for a paper two, question two style question, but one which looks purely at structure. How does Braddon use structure to build up excitement in this passage? Spend some time thinking about this, referring back to your previous notes on useful terminology when writing about structure. The second part of the extract will reappear on screen in five seconds time. So press pause to ponder. Here are some thoughts. Note the shift from narrative to dialogue. The first three sentences describe not just Robert Audley's movements, but also allude to a terrible revelation which Sir Michael is going to hear. Note that he is not told this immediately and suspense is built up as we wonder how the old man is going to react to such extraordinary news as his wife being a bigamist. Also notice how Robert Audley, within his speech, just says that Lady Audley has a confession to make. He doesn't say what that confession is about, but he does allude to the devastating effect it is going to have on his uncle. So this speech is structured to delay a crucial piece of information, something which further builds up tension and excitement. Notice how the narrative focus switches back from dialogue to description. We as readers continue to have to wait to hear the effects of Lady Audley's confession on her husband. Tension is built through the description of Sir Michael's preliminary feelings of shock. If his imperious hand is already feeble and impotent, imagine how he will react when he actually knows what has happened. Note the structure of the first paragraph within this section. Sir Michael Audley's speech is split up into two parts to give the writer the opportunity to describe the pain of his voice before hearing his reaction in full. And then we have two further paragraphs which describe dramatic physical desires and reactions before in the final paragraph of the extract, Lady Audley speaks out. But of course in the exam, you would need to produce more than annotations, however useful this exercise may be. Here's how a written response might look. How does Braddon use structure to build up excitement in this passage? The persistent shifts in narrative focus between description and dialogue help delay the climactic moment in which Lady Audley confirms that Robert Audley's accusations are true and thus result in a slow, exciting build-up of tension. For instance, the writer includes a description of Sir Michael's physical reaction to his nephew's emotional speech within a single paragraph deliberately positioned prior to his verbal response. This means that the reader needs to wait to hear the details of his almost certainly anguished reaction. However, even when we do get to hear Sir Michael's speech, we are only given the first word, Lucy. The writer includes another piece of description before continuing the utterance. The interposed description not only confirms Sir Michael's angst in far more detail than is implied by the single word exclamatory sentence, but makes the reader wait to hear for his impassioned words. The overall effect is to build up tension. So hopefully that gives you an idea about what is required. But remember, Paper two, question two, will ask you to talk about language and structure. So let's look at an actual past paper extract and question. Question two is about text one, the 39 steps by John Bucher. Look again at lines 11 to 20. How does John Bucher use language and structure to describe the difficulties of the man's escape? 
you should use relevant subject terminology to support your answer. So before the extract, the backgrounds. I crawl down the broken ladder, scattering dirt behind me to cover my footsteps. I did the same on the mill floor and on the threshold where the door hung on broken hinges. Peeping out, I saw that between me and the dovecote was a piece of bare, cobbled ground where no footmarks would show. Also, it was mercifully hid by the mill buildings from any view from the house. I slipped across the space, got to the back of the dovecote and prospected a way of ascent. That was one of the hardest jobs I ever took on. My shoulder and arm ached like hell and I was so sick and giddy that I was always on the verge of falling. But I managed it somehow. By the use of upjutting stones and gaps in the masonry and the tough ivy roots, I got to the top in the end. There was a little parapet behind which I found space to lie down. So, how is language and structure used to describe the difficulties of the man's escape? Well, my suggestion is always to think and annotate before launching forth into your response. Even for questions like this, for which there is a relatively small amount of marks available, just six. Before having a go at your own response, you might like to see my annotations. Bearing in mind that it can be tempting to neglect structure at the expense of language, I've annotated the passage twice, once for language and once for structure. Have a look. Here I've looked at language. I'm quite interested in the verbs used by the writer to emphasise the difficulties and dangers of the escape. Crawled, peeping, prospected. I'm also interested in the adjectives, the superlative hardest, and the fact that he was so sick and giddy that he nearly fell. Of course, with any language question, as soon as you see a simile, a metaphor, or an example of personification, you must leap upon it. Here, his shoulder and arm ached like hell. But we also need to explore structure. Here are some thoughts. Notice the shift in narrative focus. The first paragraph is all zoomed into the man's minute actions as he tries to escape. But then the second paragraph begins with the narrator taking a step back to reflect on just how difficult the whole situation was. We go from a past tense narrative to the narrator looking back on what he did. Other structural devices include the simple sentence, but I managed it somehow, full stop, in which exactly what it is is not confirmed until the end of the next sentence. Notice also the way the sentence by the use of outjutting stones is structured. This is a complex sentence in which the main clause, which contains confirmation of the man's successful escape, is positioned right at the end. The reader is made to wait for this revelation, is made to wade through the detail of the initial subordinate clause, and this helps build up excitement. Hopefully that's given you some helpful pointers. Time now to write your own response. In the exam booklet, you are given a single side of A4 to complete your response, for which six marks are available. It can be tricky to estimate timings for individual sections, but it's worth noting that you have two hours for the full exam, and there are a total of 80 marks available. Mathematically speaking then, which is a crude measure, you would expect to spend no more than 10 minutes on this. Get cracking. Press pause now. How did you get on? Did you manage to write equally intelligently about language and structure? Were you concise with your phrasing and precise with what you said? Here's what I wrote. Buchan's use of verbs to reference the first person narrator's movements highlights just how difficult it is for him to escape. He crawled down the broken ladder, 
This verb suggests that he is not able to be fully upright and that he has to move on his hands and knees within a tightly confined space. In a different way, verbs such as peeping and prospected show the importance of caution within his escape. The former indicates that he needs to look rapidly before withdrawing to ensure that he is not seen, whilst the latter shows that he needs to stop and survey before progressing further. The difficulties of the man's escape are emphasised by the retrospective recognition that it was one of the hardest jobs he had ever taken on, the superlative making it clear that this was an exceptionally challenging escape. Additionally, the escape was made much harder by the fact that he was in so much pain, his shoulder and arm ached like hell. This simile suggests that the man is in agony. Hell is associated with fire and severe burning, which would clearly be exceptionally painful to experience. Structurally, the switch from a narrative focus on the man's actions as he tries to escape within the first paragraph to a retrospective reflection on the job as a whole, that was one, broadens the perspective and emphasises just how difficult the whole enterprise was, even with the benefit of time. Additionally, the writer structures the second paragraph so that the revelation about the success of the escape is repeatedly delayed. In particular, there is the simple sentence, but I managed it somehow. The reader is not told exactly what it is and needs to read on further to find out. However, even the subsequent sentence is structured to build up tension. There is an initial subordinate clause by the use of, which gives further detail about the man's movement but the reader needs to reach the subsequent main clause, I got to the top, in order to learn that the man has been able to escape. How does this response meet the top band of the mark scheme? Well, at the beginning of this video, I emphasised the importance of talking about structure as well as language, so let's start with that. Notice how I reassure the examiner by explicitly signposting the fact that I'm going to talk about structure. I talk about the way the first sentence of the second paragraph signifies a brief change in narrative focus. The previous paragraph has been about the minute actions of the man as he tries to escape, and this changes to a focus which has clearly benefited from a much longer time period. What I'm doing here is providing a sophisticated appreciation of how the writer has used structure to achieve effects and influence the reader. Note also the use of precisely selected and integrated subject terminology throughout. But feature spotting alone will not cut the mustard. You also need to explore how language and structure achieve effects and influence the reader. And I do this here in my very specific, very precise analysis of the meaning and effect of the verb crawl. Note also the concision in which I assimilate two verbs from different sentences to make the overall point about the man's caution. However, as ever, detail about effect is essential. Thus, I point out that peeping shows the man's cautious fear. In order to escape, he must not be seen. Whilst prospected shows that the man really needs to visually assess, look, before deciding where to move to. Remember also that the examiner is given some indicative content, some suggested points that a candidate might make to help them with their marking. These are only suggestions, but are shown on screen now. I didn't look at this before writing my response, but appear to have included the points coloured on screen now. Press pause to read these through. And finally, exam boards provide a report to summarise what candidates did well and what they struggled with for each questions. Here are some selected comments which you may find helpful. Read them as they appear on screen.
an interesting one here. Note that they do want you to explore specific connotations of images. Not good enough here to state that the person was in extreme pain. Also worth looking at these comments here. I think it's interesting that they make reference to punctuation. And of course, punctuation is a structural, structural device. Um, perhaps it may be insightful with other extracts to refer to the effects of structural devices, such as semicolons and ellipses, say. Um, but note that I didn't include that within my grid towards the beginning, um, because the danger is that, that, that frequently there may not be a great deal to say about punctuation. And this backs up my point towards the beginning of this video in which candidates make the mistake of not writing enough about structure. So what's required in order to get the full six marks in question two from paper two? Well, examiners are looking for insight into both language and structure. Neglect the latter at your peril. They're looking for you to be specific with subject terminology. So for God's sake, make sure you know your nouns from your verbs, your compound sentences from your complexes, and your similes from your metaphors. But good luck with it all. And many thanks for watching Schofield on Shakespeare.